In this video, we're going to be talking about what a triple integral represents. In other words, when you evaluate a triple integral, what value are you actually finding? Now I'm going to assume that you already know how to use the double integral to find the volume V, so the volume V under a surface F of X, Y, so this surface here, but above the region R, which is defined over the interval A to B for X and C to D for Y, using a geometric interpretation, changing that into a Riemann sum, and then into an actual double integral, where we find the double integral of F of X, Y over the region R, when we divide the region R into subsections of area. If you want to go back and review the double integral in the context of the single integral as we transition from the single integral to the double integral, go ahead and watch my video about what the double integral represents. But in this video, we're going to focus on the triple integral and moving from the double integral to the triple integral. In order to do that, we're just going to go ahead and translate each one of these pieces that I have here on the left that I've set up for the double integral over here to the right hand side where we're going to be setting up the triple integral. So first things first, the interesting thing about the triple integral is that you can use it for two purposes. The first purpose is actually very simple and it's finding volume. In other words, yes, the triple integral will find volume in exactly the same way that the double integral finds volume. So let's talk about how that happens for a second. First of all, we have our same three dimensional coordinate space, just like we do with double integration. Except this time, when we have a double integral, we're integrating over the region R. In other words, we have this region R that's in two dimensional space, it's in the XY plane. So it's a flat two dimensional region R, and we're trying to find volume that's above that, that's sitting on top of that region. But if you're using a triple integral to find volume, then what you're doing is you're finding the volume of the box B. So this here is the box B, and the box B is defined on the interval for X from A to B, on the interval for Y from C to D, but then also on the interval for Z from R to S. So A, C, and R are all right here at the origin, so Z is defined between R and S, so R and S. And by the way, your box doesn't have to be sitting with one of its vertices at the origin. It could be anywhere in space. This box just happens to be at the origin, which is why I wanted to point out that A, R, and C in this sketch are all right at the origin. So the box B defined on A to B, C to D, R to S, which will tell you, of course, exactly where this box is in coordinate space. And if we use the triple integral to find the volume of this box, what we do is we divide the box into sub boxes. In other words, we split up this three dimensional box B into smaller pieces of volume, which are also boxes. So here with the double integral, we had the rectangular region R and we split it up into sub rectangles. So we cut it into pieces both ways in the X direction and the Y direction. And we ended up with these little smaller boxes of area A. Here, we're gonna cut this box all three ways in the X direction, the Y direction, and the Z direction. And we're gonna end up with little boxes. And those little boxes are all going to be pieces of volume. And we define the size of that piece of volume by delta V, V for volume, as opposed to in the double integral, A for area. Now here's how you use a triple integral to find volume. You go ahead and say volume is equal to, and we'll go through this formula one piece at a time. So basically what we want to do is we want to sum up all the volume in the X direction. So that would tell us, for example, how much volume we had in a row. So maybe for example, something like this, where the volume is this entire row here. So if we sum up volume in the X direction, we're getting this whole row of volume in the X direction. Then when we sum up volume in the Y direction, then we get a whole plane of volume. 
So as we go over to the Y direction, we get a whole level, a whole layer of volume that's parallel to this XY plane. Then when we sum up volume in the Z direction, we move up and we go all the way up through the top of the box and we end up with the volume of the entire box, B. So really all we're doing is just adding up the volume of each of these little cubes. So if delta V represents the cube, the volume of one cube, then the volume of this cube in particular is just one multiplied by delta V. And the volume for any other cube will also be one times delta V. So if we want to find volume of the entire box B, then we're just going to add one times delta V plus one times delta V on and on and on for however many little pieces of volume we split box B into. Now, if we talk about that in terms of summation notation, we move this formula into summation notation. Basically, what we're saying is one times delta V represents the volume of one of these little boxes. And like I said, the summation notation, we're summing up the volume first in the x direction, which is given by the first sum, then in the y direction, which is given by the second sum, and then in the z direction, which is given by the third sum, that'll give us total volume of the box. So we move to summation notation, and then finally, we move to the integral formula, where we say we're taking the triple integral of the box B by slicing up the box B into tiny pieces of volume. So basically, the takeaway here is that if we want to use a triple integral to find volume, then our integrand, this value right here, where we would normally have a function, that value is just going to be 1. So contrast that with the double integral where we have the function f of xy, which represents the surface here that's sitting on top of the volume that we're finding. So when we use a double integral to find volume, we have a function here with x and y variables included in it because f of xy is the equation of a surface, a two-dimensional surface or a plane. But when we use the triple integral to find volume, the volume that we find, that's taken care of with the triple integration, so we don't need the detail of the function. You can think about it that way. f of xy, we just have 1. The thing about using a triple integral to find volume is that it may be more convenient than using the double integral in some cases. Like if you have this box here and it is a perfect rectangular prism, a right rectangular prism, then a triple integral would be really easy to use to find volume because all you'd need is the limits of integration A and B, C and D, and R and S. You could set up a quick triple integral. You don't have to deal with any kind of function like this and you just have one as your integrand. In that case, dA here becomes dy dx or dx dy, and dv here becomes dz dy dx. And that's one other thing about double versus triple integration. So with double integration, you can either integrate first with respect to y, then x, or vice versa. So there's two orders of integration. With triple integrals, you can integrate first with respect to z, then y, then x, or any other order. And with three variables involved, there are six different orders in which you can integrate. So with double integration, just two orders, but with triple integration, six orders. Now, here's the thing. Yes, you can use a triple integral to find volume, and maybe sometimes it might be more convenient than using a double integral, maybe. But really, you're not gaining anything by using the triple integral to find volume since you already have a double integral that you can easily use to find volume. So why would you ever use a triple integral? Well, that's where the second use for a triple integral comes in. Remember before I said there are two uses really for the triple integral. The first one is finding volume, in which case instead of having a function here for the integrand, we just have one. But instead of having a double integral, we have a triple integral. So there's trade-offs there, but you don't really gain anything. Or the second use, which is really where things get interesting, and that is where the volume that we're trying to find, we get an extra dimension here, and we say that that volume now 
can have varying density. So here in the double integral, we're just finding the volume above this rectangle r and below the surface f of x, y. So whatever volume is sandwiched in between there over these particular intervals, we're finding that volume. Here, with the triple integral, we're finding the volume of some three-dimensional object using a triple integral. But what if this box, B, had varying density? It was maybe a particular section of air in the atmosphere, and one part of it is more or less dense than another part of it, or it's a fluid where one part is more dense than the other, or some kind of gas where you have varying density throughout the three-dimensional volume. Well, in that case, you can use a triple integral and you can account for that density. And even if there's varying density throughout this volume, you can use the triple integral to find mass. So we're not just finding volume anymore, we're now finding mass. And that's where the triple integral is really useful because we can use the double integral already to find volume. The triple integral is the only thing that will allow us to find mass. The double integral can't do that. So how do we find mass? Well, really, it's just about putting a function back into these formulas instead of just the one. So if we have a triple integral of the function f of x, y, z, and then dv, and we evaluate this triple integral, what we're going to be finding is mass instead of volume. So we're going to say we're finding mass. Now, a couple of important things to note. In the double integral, the function f of x, y, z here represented a surface. So it was this surface here, f of x, y. Over here, this function, f of x, y, z, represents density, the density of the volume that's inside box B. So all the volume inside box B, the varying variable density throughout this system. We're still breaking down box B into tiny little pieces of volume, but basically what we're doing is we're saying we're taking the midpoint of this little box right here, the midpoint inside this box, and we're saying, what's the density right there? And then we're looking at the density inside each little tiny sub box and adding those all together to get total mass. That's how we estimate mass using this density function in a triple integral, which is the same as using the midpoint inside each of these little sub rectangles of area and then building a column of volume that sits on top of that and saying we're taking the area of the base times the height to get the total volume of this column and then adding all of those volumes together to get total volume. Here we're looking at the midpoint of the box instead of the midpoint of the rectangle. We're saying what's the density there and then assuming that the density everywhere else inside this little sub box, the green sub box, has the same density we add that all together and we get mass. When we work backwards and we move to the summation notation, what we're saying there is that if we have the function f of x sub i, y sub j, and z sub k times delta v, we're again taking the midpoint of each sub box looking at the density there, and then adding all that together. But with the summation notation, what we're saying is that we're dividing the box B into an infinite number of subboxes in every direction. So in the X direction, instead of maybe dividing this into one, two, three subboxes, we're actually going to divide it into an infinite number of subboxes in this direction so that the subboxes are infinitely small. We're going to divide the y direction into an infinite number of increments and the z direction into an infinite number of increments so that eventually our boxes are very, very small. They're more tightly packed around their midpoints 
And so that midpoint gives a better and better approximation, the more boxes we use, of the density in that box until eventually we use an infinite number of subboxes in every single direction such that every midpoint perfectly approximates the density at that point. And then when we're doing a perfect approximation in every direction, x, y, and z, we get from the summation notation to the integral. So that's what we're saying. The limit as L, M, and N goes to infinity, that means we're dividing the box B into an infinite number of subboxes in the x direction, y direction, and z direction. And then with an infinite number of subboxes, we sum them together in the x direction, and then in the y direction, and then in the z direction. And when we sum all of those up, when this represents the density, we get a perfect representation of density everywhere with the triple integral, which when we evaluate that triple integral is going to give us the mass of the box B. Now all we have to do is make this geometric representation match so that our formulas are perfect. This would look like f of x sub 1, y sub 1, z sub 1 times delta v, and then plus f of x sub 2, y sub 2, z sub 2 times delta v. And we would just keep going, adding all of those little volumes together. So basically, if we start with a formula, trying to come up with a formula for mass using a triple integral, well, we would start with the geometric representation. And this basically says the density function evaluated at point number one, because we have x sub one, y sub one, z sub one. And then the density function evaluated at midpoint number two, because we have x sub two, y sub two, z sub two. So we're taking the midpoint from each one of our subboxes, multiplying by delta v, and that's giving us the mass, because when we say density times volume, that's giving us the mass of each subbox. So we're adding those all together. Then we're saying we're taking now an infinite number of subboxes in every direction, the x, y, and z direction, summing those all up, and that'll give us a perfect representation of mass. And once we have this summation notation with the sums and the limit going to infinity, that translates directly into the integral, and in this case, the triple integral. And so we can say then that mass is the triple integral of the density function over the entire volume of the box B when we divide the box B into infinitely small pieces of volume. And that's what the triple integral represents. That's what the triple integral allows you to do. It allows you to add another dimension to this problem so that instead of just finding volume, like the double integral can do, the triple integral can say that the density of the volume inside this box changes throughout the volume. And so if we have this kind of variable system, we get to put that extra dimension into the triple integral. And that's how the triple integral becomes a more powerful tool for us than the double integral.